Cause tell I'm gonna me what every time. to do <laughs> To make all my Lucker Lake dreams come true Hello everybody, Bob Lust of Palm Boss Coming at you live tonight from the world headquarters of uh, Palm Boss Magazine Happy to be passing through, got to Spend some time with Trevor Shot Vet today. He and I went up to uh, um, outside of Tulsa to take a look at a lake being built in process. And tomorrow we're going to go look at one that's going to be real fun to watch. It's progress over near Post, Texas. Which, for those of you guys that know this state, you say Post, Texas can have water? Their average annual rainfall over there is something like 20 inches a year. So we're gonna to have to take advantage of the watershed. We're gonna to to take advantage of uh, uh, whatever opportunities we get. Now, part of the problem over there is the evaporation rate. Now it's got a lack of, probably, a, I think I remember like a 2,000 acre watershed for a lake that covers about 20 acres. But evaporation is over 90 inches a year. So hey, you guys know the drill. We're gonna talk about some fun stuff here. Pete Gogger, Jeremy Duckworth, Wyatt, Kenniger, Mike Cottrell, Wesley Ellis, James Sewell. I see you guys checking in. Good to see you. Um, you know the drill. Hashtag Palm Boss Magazine in the comment sections. Tag your friends that you know have a pond or a lake. Click like. Share to your timeline. You're eligible for a drawing for a Palm Boss hat. A Palm Boss mug. Say it with me, Trevor, that knows how to. Things hot, Keep hot things cold, hot and cold things cold. Trevor's sitting right over here in the chair right behind me watching see how this how this little thing happens. We don't know how it does, but it does. Yeah, we don't know how it does, but it does. That's right. That's right. So I'm um, glad you're here. I see John Funk checking in from mid Michigan. Had a big storm yesterday and your power is out again. Oh, but wait, your power is back on and you can watch. Cool. Glad you're checking in. Frank James from outside of Shreveport, Louisiana. Hey, Kim Moore from India, uh, Illinois checking in. Good to see her. So um, I thought today I've had a pretty good flurry of, uh, hey, there's Wayne. Hey, Wayne. Wayne and Josie. Hey, have we found a place to go? I'm going to have to call you and let you know about it. But we've got a, we've got a deal. We found a place outside of Granbury where we're trying to live. The uh, house is still being remodeled. We're not quite ready yet, but it won't be long. Maybe another year and a half or month. I don't know. One or the other. Um, but we found a pretty cool place. Wayne, tell Josie. If she's looking over your shoulder, Josie, oh, I'll call you guys and tell you about it because it's really fun. So uh, I've had a pretty big flurry of pond renovation opportunities lately. And some of them I've been involved in. Some of them I've watched. Uh, one in particular I watched was the Dallas Hunting and Fishing Club south of Dallas, Texas. They wanted to go in and see how much silt they could remove from a 125-acre lake within the budget. And there's a, one of the first thing I'm going to tell you about renovating a pond or a lake is there are a lot of unknowns. Now you can go in, you can map the bottom of the lake while it's still full of water, and you can get a rough idea with the sonar of how much of that soil under the water on the bottom is soft and how much of it isn't soft. Now it can be a little deceiving, especially if there's been some sand or some other type of soil deposited on top of silt. Then you get a missed reading. Now, if you get out there with a with a long pole and you can push through that silt till you hit something firm, then you can begin to get an estimate. But with this big 125 acre lake, the maps were a little misleading, and so were the probes because there was like some area, several areas, where there was 18 inches of sand sitting on top of 10 and 12 feet of silt. And until you get out there with a machine and start digging around there, you don't know. There's a renovation going on right now west of Wichita, Kansas. Uh, a uh, fella wrote uh, to me and said he wanted to show me some pictures. He wanted to take a 65-year-old uh, lake in ag country that had been silting in for years and years and years, five-acre lake, and he thought he could drain the water off and then come back in and it would be economically feasible to move all that silt out. It's not. When you start thinking about this silt, first of all, it's like jello pudding. I don't care how long it sits, it isn't going to get dry. I used to think it would, but it can't. It physically can't because what happens, it gets a crust on top. The silt on top, the top foot will dry up and it'll crust and it'll break open. You'll see cracks everywhere. But right below those cracks, maybe 18 inches, maybe two feet, maybe two and a half feet, it's going to be it's going to be silt because that silt doesn't have a way for the water to escape from it. 
You know, so I've seen lakes actually ponds sit dry for two years and get machinery out there and you still can't get the silt out because it's too mucky. Now, I'm not going to tell you it can't be done because with off-road dump trucks and a track hoe, a, 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 a wheel and a way and a big thick back pocket, you can. So uh, another one I'm, I'm helping with is over near Jacksonville, Texas, about a 20 acre lake. I had a gentleman call me, I don't know, two or three weeks ago, and he originally called me about fish questions. So he started talking about fish. He'd been managing his fishery on this 20-acre lake for about four years. He'd called over a 1,000 bass, <laughs> stocked bluegills, fed them, just like the book says, but he wasn't seeing any growth rates on his bass, and his catch rates weren't dropping as much as he thought they should. You know, so 50 bass in a 20-acre lake, that's a 1,000 bass, 50, 50 bass per acre. So his, his harvest should have been enough that he could see a difference. And then he called me a little bit later. He says, hey, I've got another question for you. I was really looking at my dam, and I'm worried about it. It's got, looks like several weak spots, and I don't want it to blow. So as, as chance had it, I've, I had a chance to go over that way to look at another project on a new lake that I'm getting to help with. So I made an appointment with him that same day and went and looked. And I said, you know, really what you need to do? He, and, and another thing he pointed out to me, he says, part of, the, part of the thing that bugs me about my lake is I'm not comfortable taking a lot of people out there because it's like bumper pool. Because apparently a bunch of timber was left standing and it's all rotted off. And the stumps are right below the water surface. And if I've got, you know, an 80-year-old grandmother from church out there fishing and I bump a log and dump her in the water, we got a problem. So I said, you know, in order to properly fix this dam, and what had happened, the dam had eroded back to the point where there were several narrow spots, and there was no slope. And as we were looking at the dam, we looked at it from on top by driving, but we also looked at it in a boat. <laughs> and this, is, this, this kind of spooked me a little bit. As we were looking at the front side of the dam, there was no slope. It was straight up and down, dispersible soils that had been eroded. But I kept seeing these granite-looking rocks or granite-looking um, squares laying up there. And as we got closer, I started looking at some of them had names on them. They were tombstones. So I asked him, I said, who robbed the graveyard? <laughs> he said, I don't know where those came from, but what I think, he says, I think it's a monument company where they were etching into these stones and didn't quite get it right, you know, or maybe you can't misspell somebody's name on a tombstone, so that doesn't work. So all these tombstones ended up holding the soils in on his lake. So he brought in a, a, heavy, a guy with some heavy equipment, got a bed, brought him in, and the plan, the guy wanted to cut the dam and drain the lake. But wait, there was a 12-inch PVC pipe. So I said, well, what if, <clears throat> what if a track hoe wraps around it with a chain and see if they can't pull that off or crush that pipe or something and drain the lake slowly? Don't cut the dam. Let's see if you can get the water out through the pipe, because you have a pipe. So they got their heads together and figured out how to drain it, got the water off, got the pipe out, drained that lake dry. And I went and looked at it. Now, at the end of this broadcast, I'll see if I can't post a couple of pictures, because it was pretty amazing. Let's see here. I'm gonna, I'll am gonna. i come back to that here in just a minute. Let me see what's going on here. Yep. All right. Michael Eric checking in from Iowa. Mike Cook from North Carolina, Boy Scouts. Josie, yep. Oh, you're in packing mode. Oh, my. Well, I can't wait to hear about that. There's Tom Blasdell. Good to see him. Nick Allen, quick off-topic question. Our pond has grass carp, and this year I've caught four on a 132nd ounce jig and a half-inch crawler while bluegill fishing. Is this normal for carp to hit on the jig? It is not. It's normal for them to hit on lettuce <laughs> or grass or pond weed. Uh, but, no, it's really not normal, although... If you're feeding your fish and they get used to fish food, I can see how they get they can get conditioned to, to hit a jig and, and chase that night crawler because it's got a similar scent as to fish food. So the answer to your question is no, that's not normal, but I can sure see it happening. Let's see here. I see Mike Cook, Chuck Brinkman's checking in. Good to see Chuck. Um, so anyway, going back to this lake in East Texas, after he drained it, it looked like, i tell you what it looked like. It looked like a matchstick factory out there. It looked like, I bet you, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't count trees, but literally in the basin of that lake, there was not one tree cut out of that basin when it was built. Not one. Everyone was left standing. 
Now, when I post these pictures, it's going to be interesting for you to watch. I want you to look at a couple of them at the end of the end of the show. I'll post them before I cut out of here. We're going to go find a hotel room in Wichita Falls or somewhere. And uh, but before we go, I'll go. I'll go post. But what was interesting was over a span of several years, those trees died and then began to rot and slough off limbs. And those limbs fell straight down in the water right there by those, those trees. So what you ended up with was a vertical stump with tree limbs that eventually just settled and became nothing. So it's a lot of random stumps under the water, unsafe. And I'm talking hundreds of stumps. When when you see this video, you'll you'll see what I, I mean. Uh, this uh, when I when I post the picture, you'll see what I'm talking about. I'm going to put a uh, a panoramic picture up and then a close up picture so you can see them. But there are literally hundreds of just tree trunks sticking up all the way to where the surface of the water was. Some of them are 15 feet tall in 15 feet of water. So what ended up is you had all this vertical structure, which was way too much and way too random. So what his mission is now, now what they ended up doing with this dam is they shaved the dam down six feet on the front side slope. They left the back side alone because it was covered in trees. They pulled all the trees off the front side, got all the all the uh, tombstones out and went and stacked them up. They're going to use those for fish structure. And then they started shaving the front 75% of the dam down. And they shaved it down and let the let that, and it, when they got the topsoil off, there was clay under there, good clay, because the dam doesn't leak. So they started shaving it down, and they, what they did was they were able to shave it with a bulldozer and let that dirt flow over the side. And then once they got the slope shaped like they wanted, which is about a three to one slope, then they're going to come back up and start adding clay and compact it. And then when I was there on whatever day it was, it was Monday, Labor Day, they had three heavy duty dump trucks and filling them with clay from next to the pond where they're building hatchery ponds, by the way. They're gonna build two 10th acre hatchery ponds to grow bait fish in by excavating the clay, moving the clay over on top of the dam to build the height back up. So the mission was was to to widen the dam, take it down, fix the slope, come back up to elevation, and then stop. And they they were compacting it with the dump trucks full of dirt. So they had, they had a pretty good process going on. And one thing I noticed this is for those of you guys that pay attention to dirt moving, the traco would load a dump truck. It would back 250 yards or whatever the distance is across the dam dump its load, and then pull straight out. It wasn't turning around, going, turning around, dumping. It was going back and forth. Back and in, pulling out straight. Back and in, pulling out straight. Which is a really, really smart way to move more dirt. So I was pretty impressed with that. I see Danny Mack. Yep, um, great day here. The fish that eat pellets are crazy, even, even in the pond light in the evening. That's very cool. Good to see Danny Mack. All right, so if you got questions, bring them to me. But uh, the uh, this particular renovation is going to be tricky because let me. Here, I'm going to give you some tips now. I've seen this on on where there's silt. You, you, it, here here's the best case scenario. The best case scenario is to get the water off, and then depending on how deep the silt is, decide how to move it. If you can get and every pond has a bottom. The silt is sitting on something. What you got to figure out is, is it worth, you know, the, the, the squeeze, is there enough juice worth the squeeze to dig that silt, load it up, and move it? Now, keep in mind, you're going to move it several times. You're going to dig it up. There's one. Load it on a dump truck. Move it. There's two. Unload it. Let it dry up. There's three. And then you're going to take a bulldozer and spread it out and mix it in with whatever soils you've got. There's really, there's three times that dirt's going to be moved. So that's three times the cost of moving the dirt one time. So my first piece of advice, when somebody calls me and says, I want to renovate a pond, I ask them this, can you raise the dam to get the depth you need? If you can raise the dam, if you get enough room to raise the dam three or four feet to gain the three or four feet you want, then that's by far the least expensive way to go about the pond renovation. You get a bigger pond. You get the depth you need, 
you know, and it's, it's, it's brand new water flooded on brand new soil. If that's not feasible, can you go downstream or upstream and build another pond? Because I pretty well bet you building a, a brand new pond is going to cost considerably less than trying to get the silt out of a pond, move it somewhere else, let it dry, and then spread it. So there's my tips. Now, don't discount dredging. Dredging, when you're, when you're talking to people that dredge, they're going to give you a high dollar cost. And they're figuring the volume that, they, that they'll move and the cost based on wet weight. So when you take silt and it's wet, it weighs so much and a, a cubic yard of wet, wet silt is bigger than a cubic yard of dry silt because the water is out of the dry silt. So they're going to quote you somewhere around $10 a cubic yard to dredge it, depending on how far they have to pump it. Okay, don't discount that. That, that could be cheaper because what happened with the Dallas Hunting and Fishing Club, the trucks, the dump trucks, couldn't navigate in the bottom of the lake. Now, with like with the Purina renovation over at Gray Summit, they were able to excavate, get under the silt, build a road in the bottom of the lake with a ramp coming out. So all they had to do was dig the dirt, dig the silt, put it on the in the in the dump trucks, haul it, put it in a big hole that they dug 150 yards away. So that worked pretty good, but at the Dallas Hunting and Fishing Club, it didn't. So what they had to do is they had to build roads to the dump site, open up a dump site, then they had to build peninsulas going out into the basin of the lake where dump trucks could back up on solid soil, be loaded, and the way they loaded it was one track hoe was sitting in the silt up to its, where its, its pivot point, picking it up, spinning around, dumping it over close to these to this to this levee or this peninsula, where a second track hoe picked it up, put it in the dump truck so they could haul it off. So that bang for the buck wasn't very good. You know, looking at uh, this renovation over in Jacksonville that I was just telling you about with all the stumps sticking up, the own, the man that owns that really wants to get rid of a bunch of those stick-ups. You know, so he talked to his, his uh, drag, drag line, uh, not drag line, but track hoe guy, and the guy gave him a bid. And it was way, way, way higher than what he expected. And the cost there is he's going to have to bring in mats, big, heavy, wooden mats, like gigantic, uh, they look like huge um, uh, cross ties that the, that, the, that the track hoe can walk out on on top of yucky soil to evenly distribute the weight so he doesn't sink down in the muck so he can work. Now they used those at the Purina project and it worked great. But here's the catch. You can't, they cost a lot of money. You rent them and you rent them by the day. And it's a pretty big cost, a pretty big expense. You know, then throw in the fact with the Dallas Hunting and Fishing Club, they kept having water percolate in from the surrounding soils, it didn't stop raining. It's right next to the Trinity River. So they had these big diesel pumps set up, pumping all day long to get the water down low enough so the heavy equipment could work. So there was a bunch of additional expenses they didn't expect. They didn't expect to build a road. They didn't expect to build five peninsulas so the dump trucks could move the dirt. They didn't expect the silt you know, to have a 18 inches of sand sitting on top of 10, of tw 10 or 12 feet of silt. So they had to be kind of light on their feet. They had a budget. They had to stay within that budget. So they didn't get to, to uh, they didn't get to cover the surface area they wanted, but they ended actually increased the volume of the lake, you know, and got to create some pretty good fish habitat. So uh, now the one west of Wichita, Kansas, it's about a five acre lake. Water's been off of it for several years. And the earth mover comes over there part time when he's got time between jobs and he excavates. But they sent me a, a drone image and it looks like, <clears throat> Basically, he's taken this five-acre pond and he's dug a channel beside it, and that's, you know, spending twenty-five or thirty thousand dollars to move half an acre worth of silt, put it in dump trucks, and haul it off. You don't have much to show for it. Now, the problem with that one is they can't raise the dam, and they can't go anywhere else and build another one because that is the maximized site that has silted in after its sixty-five-year life. So now they're in a little bit of a dilemma. Do they want to spend $150,000 to get all the silt out? Or do they want to remove enough, you know, to get 
a three acre lake and then shape the rest of it the best they can and live with it. And then over the winter, it and in, in the spring it filled back up with water. So now they got to get the water off again. So that's a pumping expense because there's no pipe in that dam. So there's a whole lot of things that you got to think about before you decide to renovate a pond. Um, today up up south of uh, we're near Beggs, Oklahoma, southwest of Tulsa today. There's about a 10 acre lake in process. Now the upper three and a half acres. Okay, let me do it this way. The lower six and a half acres, they had to excavate a huge amount of dirt to build the dam. The dam was over engineered in my opinion. They've got six feet of freeboard, which when you work with like the NRCS or other government agencies, they're gonna call it, they're gonna have you do it that way. And that's what happened here. It's fine, it's just a lot of dirt. And they excavated it out of the basin of what's gonna be the lake. Now Looking up in that in that area behind the excavation, there's going to be about three and a half acres of water flooded that's going to be from zero down to 10 feet deep with about a three to one slope going down to that 10 feet. But the problem is it's 100% wooded. And if he leaves it that way, you fast forward, you know, 10 or 15 years, and he's going to have a similar situation as to what the guy over there in Jacksonville's got. So what we, what idea we came up with today was to take the basin of the lake up there that has not been uh, cut and take out a hole about as big around as two or three pickup trucks. <clears throat> and then coming off of those dig channels all the way to where the water line is gonna be and make those channels 14 to 16 feet wide. You know, the depth isn't nearly as important because these, they have a good three to one slope and remove all the trees. And what that will do, he loves to, his goal is kayak fishing. That's what he wants. And so rather than leaving all that timber standing up to where he can't navigate through it, he's gonna cut lanes with a hub with spokes coming off the hub. And that way he can go out and fish that whole area without uh, the risk of, you know, all those trees dying and, and being random and in, in not really holding a whole lot of fish. So there you go. Let's take a minute and say thank you to Karina Mills. You folks that, you guys that watch this show all the time know that uh, I'm really fond of Purina Mills and it's, it's not only because they produce great products, it's because they're interested in us. They're interested in you, they're interested in me. Now, I, I do hear way too often that people can't get the products they want. If you'll tell me about that, I'll put you in touch with the powers that can get it done. Because every single Purina dealer can get any Purina product. Now, some places in the country, it's a little harder for them to get some products, but they can get it. You know, and the thing I love about Purina Mills is they've worked hard to create products that guys like us can use to grow some big fish, grow them faster. And I'm just a big fan. And I mean, I don't work for them. I'm not on their, you know, I'm not, I don't get a, I don't get a dead gum W two from them. It'd be good, <laughs> but I do believe in their products, and I've seen what they can do. And along that same lines, I always also appreciate Texas Hunter, Texas Hunter feeders, their Texas Hunter deer blinds. Those guys make great products. Now, even better than that, it's it's you got to have good products in our marketplace. If you don't, you know nobody wants to be going out chasing timers and trying to figure out why the battery went dead, you know, and all that. Well, Texas Hunters customer service is, is super. If I send him an email or, or call Chris Blood over there, if I, if I call him by two o'clock that day, whatever I order is going out that day. So my hat's off to them. David Schneiderman, Easy Docs of Texas, he's a sponsor of this show as well. And so is Greg Grimes, Aquatic Environmental Services over in Ball Ground, Georgia. I've known Greg since he was a little bitty kid and, and still had totally dark hair. <laughs> So uh, I appreciate you guys and your support. I'm glad you're watching this. Let me see what we got going on here. Let me look here. Let me back up. <laughs> hey, Vito, calling me El Jefe, all aquatics. Hey, man, what's going on over there? Good to see you guys. So glad you guys are watching this show, checking in. If you have questions, pitch them to me because I'm ready for that. Doug Cusick, wish I had known all this seven and a half years ago before mine was finished. 
Granted, they hit springs and opened up water before it was complete, so me sealing the bottom was out of the question. This was a new build. The locals did the dirt work and built the dam. I learned a lot what not to do. You know, I tell you, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plug the Bob Lusk Institute of Higher Pondology right here. If you go to pondboss.com and click on um, Institute link, it will take you to teachable.pondboss.com. Now, you're going to pay for it, which is okay because I paid for it to put it up there. And, all, and, and I, you know, I mean, I don't mind doing free stuff, but I don't mind you paying for stuff that's going to help you keep from paying the dumb tax. And that's what it's designed for. Uh, it's not what you know, it's what you don't know. And, you know, and, and that's the way it works. So what I hear Doug saying is there's things that he didn't know that now he does that maybe he'd have done it just a little bit different. Maybe not. And one of the things I see that's consistent when I travel around, and if somebody calls me, they've got a lake, they want me to come look at it. We go sit down, we look at it, we sit down, and the first thing they say is, I wish I'd have known this, I'd have done this different. What I'd rather hear you guys say is, I am so glad we did it this way. And that means being educated. And that's part of what the Institute of Higher Pondology is designed to do, is to give you knowledge of prime content that you otherwise can't find on University of Google or YouTuber. You know, this is stuff that you can use on your ponds, your lakes coming, whether you're going to build one, stock one, manage the fishery, deal with aquatic plants. If you want to learn about water chemistry, we got that. You know, so there's, I think, six different uh, modules out there, and they all have a price, but they're worth it. So there you go. So I know it now when Chris Blood sees this, he's going to send me a text and say, Adam, boy, Bob. Good to see you promote yourself a little bit. Well, I'm, I'm kind of queasy, but you know what? That's okay. Okay, let's see here. Mike Rosa. Howdy, boss. Ever seen Bowfin keep bass population limited? No, I have not. But what I have seen is I've seen Bowfins in Acid Water Lakes inhabit their segment of the environment and not disrupt the population of bass. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you they won't eat a bass. They will. You know, but what I haven't seen, I haven't yet to see a lake where the bass can't keep up by reproducing, you know, by surviving. There's very, very, very few lakes where bass can't thrive. Now, the both ends, they, they can't reproduce and can't out, they can reproduce, but they can't out reproduce a bass. So both ends, uh, I think they're kind of cool fish. They're prehistoric looking things, toothy, cool looking fish. I kind of like them. When I'm shocking a lake and I find one, Sometimes the owner makes me take it out, but if he doesn't, I'm gonna put it back. I think it's kind of cool. They eat you know, top water. yeah. The <laughs> Trevor's saying they like to eat a top water, and I totally get that. I've caught several of them on top waters. I've caught them on frogs. I've caught them on um, buzz baits before. They're really fun. So let's see what Mike Cook says. We're hydroceding all around our pond. Should we worry about fertilizer going in the pond from runoff? We're hoping to introduce feeder fish in early October. As long as you follow the recommended rate for the fertilizer to put on the grass, and then where you are, you should be able to wet it in. If you can wet that fertilizer into the soils, so when that grass seed sprouts, it's getting its nutrients immediately, those rates are determined to support the grass, not the pond. So even if you get a little runoff, it's, if, if you do it at the right rates, then the amount of fertilizer that gets into the water is going to be limited. Plus, most of those fertilizers for grass are high nitrogen. Most of the limiting factors in ponds that cause algae to grow or rooted aquatic plants is typically phosphorus. You know, so as long as you're using it at the rate, and if, if you can water it in, water it in, you're less likely to put it in your pond. Let's see here. Michael Eric, my buddy, started filling his five-acre pond this spring. When the deeper spots got 10 feet, I stocked five gallons of fathead minnows. A month later, we stocked bluegills and red ear and 500 hybrid sunfish. Then I introduced 37 to 9-inch mature bluegills. Last week, I introduced 26 9 to 12-inch black crappie. Boy, you had me till that. Walleye and largemouth bass coming this fall. Will 26 black crappie get things started next spring? I have no idea because they're unpredictable. One of the things I don't like about crappie in small waters is the fact that, in like in the Midwest, they may not be the fish that spawns first, but you get much further to the south than the Mason-Dixon line they are. 
Now, they're fickle because what will happen is when the water temperature is just right in the upper 50s, they'll stage. Then when it hits the uh, right at 60, they're going to move up and start spawning. But if you get a cold front that pushes that water temperature down 3 degrees, they're going to go back out and stage again. You know, and if they do that four or five times over a four or five week period, they won't spawn. And so when they don't spawn, they'll absorb their eggs. You don't get any recruitment. But in the years when they spawn and they're first and their babies succeed and they're thriving and growing, their babies are going to turn around and start eating babies coming off the nests of the other fish that spawn beyond them, like baby bluegills, baby bass, etc. So the fact that they're, that they're um, uh, unpredictable spawners, the fact that they spawn first in most lakes, with the exceptions would be smallmouth bass and yellow perch. Those fish are going to spawn before crappie do in midwestern and northern waters. You know, now the other the other factoid is they're top line predators. They're going to eat meat, but they're limited by their mouth size. So what happens with black crappie and even white crappie is they're going to be feeding on your bait fish when they're about that big. Now, keep in mind, I mean, I, I pound this out every time I'm talking to you guys about the food chain. It takes about 10 pounds of bait fish for a game fish to gain a pound. It takes 10 pounds of food for a bluegill to gain a pound. It takes 10 pounds of the food the bluegill eat for them to gain a pound. So at each level of the food chain, it's a 10 to 1 conversion, primarily because what they eat's wet. You know, 80% of it, 80% of that 10 pounds, 8 pounds is water, 2 pounds of goodies. You know, but still, you got to produce it for them to eat it. So what happens with crappie, and their mouths are too small to be big and too big to be small, so they're feeding on smaller bait fish. And when a bluegill that's about this big gets eaten and can't live another 30 days to where it's that big, then it takes it out of the food chain for the other predator fish like bass. So crappie compete with bass a little lower on the food chain. I don't like that, especially if largemouth bass are the targets. So now I'm going to also tell you, I've seen people succeed stocking crappie in small waters, but I'm also going to tell you that's temporary and it's fleeting. It may only be five years, but that might be the best five crappie years you're going to get. There's another thing about crappie. If when you get ready to harvest some of those things, you're going to be able to harvest 20 to 25 pounds per acre per year. So that means if they weigh a pound, you're going to get 20 to 25 crappie out of that five acre pond times five. You're going to be able to harvest 100 crappie a year. And that's going to be it. You know, and if that's okay with you, that's okay with me. But I have yet to meet an angler that says, I fish for crappie for sport. Every single one of you says, I want crappie because I want to eat them. Well, go down the road to the public lake, <laughs> build you some crappie holes, and go catch them over there and keep them out of that small water. Now, that's just my opinion. So, Michael, will the black crappie get things started next spring? You tell me, are they going to spawn next spring? Are they going to spawn first? If they do, they're going to get started, get crappie started. All right, James Allen checking in from Kentucky. Good to see, good to see you. Ron Ardwine from down south Louisiana, Lake Charles area. They, uh, they, they skipped Hurricane Ida the other day, which is good for them, not so good for their running buddies over to the east of them. But um, Ron sent me some pretty cool pictures of bluegill on spawning beds. I'll pull those up and post them on the Facebook page here in the next few days when I get a minute when I'm not driving. Frank James, hey Bob, trying to feed my largemouth bass and hybrid striped bass throughout their life. I stock threadfin shad, tilapia every year, and of course have copper nose bluegill and redder sunfish. So I'm amazed I know all those acronyms. <laughs> Question is, does it make sense to also stock golden shiners and rainbow trout this fall? Or would cold water sluggishness mean they wouldn't do much to feed my larger predators? Um, they would feed your predators. Just because the predators are sluggish doesn't mean they're not that those bait fish won't be available to be eaten. Now, the golden shiners are going to be sluggish when it's cold, but when the water starts to warm up and the bass start to move more, the rainbow trout are going to get sluggish. You know, so when rainbow trout are operating at peak temperatures and, and bass aren't, when the water temperature changes, it goes like this. And when it gets about like that, there's a collision. And when that happens, those rainbow trout that are eligible size for your eligible bass or eligible for food. They're going to get eaten. Okay, so here, let's see. James Allen talking about fish food. 
I found that Aquamax Largemouth Bass Nuggets is not on Tractor Supplies contact with Purina. Purina's agreement with Tractor Supplies, that's a really kind of a tenuous, I'm not going to say tenuous, it's an interesting ar arrangement because what happens is they've got a contract with Tractor Supply for a certain lineup of products, which aggravated the dealers years ago when they first made that deal because leadership back then wanted to try to get volume up. So when a tractor supply store is competing against a local dealer, that caused a little friction. So one of the ways that Purina tried to, to fix that was to give exclusive sales of certain products to the dealers and let tractor supply be the big box store and do what they do. So um, feeder supply was willing and able to special order anything. Hope this helps. There you go. That's it. James Allen says we had a... Uh, Sudden issue with sudden issue with water primrose that just exploded this month. Shore sheer shore clear seems to knock it back. Any thoughts? Vito says it takes one pound of Brussels sprouts for me to gain one pound. <laughs> Vito, you ought to cook them and then eat them. Um, with the primrose issue that exploded this month. Uh, that primrose, it, primrose is is a, a viney looking plant. It's called creeping yellow water primrose, almost like a poem rolling right off your tongue. It's a vine that grows from the shore, comes out. It's got kind of olive covered, uh, olive colored leaves that are shiny, like because they're waxy. Then it sprouts a little yellow flower, and most of you have that. It's it's one of the most common plants out there. Now, part of the reason that it exploded is because all the conditions were perfect. It had the food it needed. It had the, the photo period it needed. It was able to, to gain um, an advantage and grow explosively, and it did. You know, it, sometimes it takes that stuff a little bit of time to get jump started, but once it does, now when it starts growing out, that plant starts putting roots down. And when those roots hit the soil and can take up nutrients from the soil, that helps it to grow. So when it's got like six or eight sets of roots along a string of the vine, that's when it really blows up because then it starts putting shoots off and starts getting taller and moving out and covering bigger areas. Vito eats Brussels sprouts. Vito, you're pretty funny. Danny Mac, wow, I'm now so aware of the differences between North and South Ponds. I, I love you, Danny Mac. You, 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 you're, you're so good at this. Uh, there's Tim Stewart checking in from Florida, the, the, the apiary king. Fred Bingaman, I'm late. Start over. Okay, where do you want me to start? Look at there. There's Jacob West. Michael Eric, I called my local tractor supply by the MVP, no can do. Now, Michael, I'm not, I don't ever scold anybody on this show, so I'm not scolding you. Call up you're in a dealer, not tractor supply. Call your local dealer and see what they can do. Let's see, Ron, would the more accurate time to check and record standard weights be in the summer? During the summer, the fish are lethargic. Uh-oh. I scrolled past it. Hold on a minute. Would the more accurate time to check and record standard weights be in the summer? During summer, the fish are lethargic, not moving as much, not eating as much, maybe not expending as much energy having less food content in their stomach, so the standard weights you record would be mostly body mass, correct? It seems if you check standard weights in the fall when the fish are very active because of cooler water, they're burning more energy, gorging themselves before winter. Could a fourth of the weight of the fish be from recent forage contents that aren't converted into body mass yet, giving you a higher weight than it actually is? I never, ever dreamed you would ask that question, but here's, here's going to be my answer. You want relative weights year round. Now that's why the, that's why the curve is called a standard curve. The standard is three hundred thousand fish weighted and measured over a three decade period, logged in and makes it that averages it out. So the standard curve is what a fish of that weight should of that length should weigh. But Normal bass can be within 5% of that curve, of that standard curve, and be just fine. And it's seasonal. You know, if, if you weigh, 
If you weigh bass in the in, in January, February, March, April, pre-spawn, what you're going to see is is you're going to see what looks like numbers that are skewed because you're going to have some that are seriously underweight, which are the males, and some that are seriously overweight and much bigger. That's the girls, you know. But then when they spawn, just within weeks of this after they spawn, all those weights are going to go down even further than they were when you started. You know, and then in the summer, the food chain is expanding. And by the time we hit this time of the year and a pond that's got some semblance of balance, what you're going to see is those fish, those predator fish are going to try to catch up and gain weight to get ready for the winter. So they do, when the temperature drops, they do go on feeding frenzy so they can gain the weight. So what I'm going to tell you is weigh and measure some in the spring, some in the summer, some in the fall. And if you catch a few in the winter, weigh them and measure them then. Log all those in, put your timelines down, and then see if those relative weights change over a long period of time. And that's the best way to do it. So checking it in the summer and only the summer kind of skews the numbers for the rest of the year. You know, because in the summer, if, they're, if their metabolism is slow and they're not feeding as much, you know, then they're probably losing weight until the food chain bulks up enough that they can start feeding more actively in their prime operating temperature like we're getting ready to get into and then their growth rates are going to go up and their relative weights are going to go up. So the two times a year that fish gain the weight the most is when they have the most forage which is which is is with the massive spawns early spring and the grow out of the forage fish in the fall. In the fall you're going to see the best growth rates because they're, they're through reproducing and they can focus on gaining weight. So, great question. I love that. Hope I got it right. Okay, talking about Jacob. <laughs> That's good. Tim Stewart, with heavy aeration, how fast can bacteria break down muck in a pond? Can this also drastically change water quality? Yes, I'll tell you exactly what happens. Heavy aeration can break bacteria down fast depending on the source. If, if the nutrient source is arrested, it can break down the, those, um, the, uh, the, the muck that's organic. It can break it down pretty fast. Now, one of the things you've got to be careful about, the thing about aeration is it's steady. It's the mule pulling the plow. It keeps a pace. What you don't really want are spikes, up and down spikes, because that affects the water quality. If your pH is rising and falling every day because the water's working overtime to get rid of too much nutrient load, then you're going to see water quality deteriorate, even though the aeration system's doing its job. You know, so that's my answer for that. All right, now let me scroll down here and see what else we got here. Let's see here. I see the conversation going on about fish food. Billy Bates, what do you know about the Georgia Giant Hybrid? Do you think they will grow better than your standard bluegill green sunfish hybrid? Um, no. 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 Um, now, the, the hatchery that, that was the one that created the Georgia Giants, they professed to take the best, biggest female green sunfish and cross them with the best, biggest male bluegills. But they also posted pictures of Hogzilla, stating that that hog weighed some humongous amount. I don't remember what it was, but it was like 1,200 pounds or something ridiculous. And somebody went in, dug it up, and it was half that size. So it's kind of hard to have the credibility when something like that happens, even though that happened a long time ago. So the, the, the question you're asking me is, is what do I know about the Georgia giant? I do think that there's a few hatcheries that spend the time to do some selective breeding to create the best hybrid bluegills that they can, which is a cross between the best male bluegills and the best female green sunfish. There are a few hatcheries around the nation that do that. Uh, I think the, the, they advertised back in the day when they were still going heavy. They advertised they'd get to be five pounds. Well, over 25 years, they probably had one, and it was the only one that survived in that pond for some goofy reason. They don't get that big. They just don't. 
Now, they'll get to be a pound and a quarter, a pound and a half, maybe a pound and three quarters. Now, you, you can't scoff at that. That's pretty big. But the expectations I would have of hybrid sunfish is that they're very aggressive, easy to catch, grow faster than a bluegill or either one of its parents does for the first two and a half or three years. Then bluegill catch up with them and pass them up. So if you like to have pound and a quarter to pound and three quarter sunfish that are aggressive with a big mouth, easy to catch, eat fish food, that's a good choice. Now, if you want them, if you want a fish in there that's going to reproduce to help provide food for bass, bad choice. They don't reproduce at nearly the rates. Now, a true hybrid is not supposed to reproduce, but those fish do. However, about 95% of their offspring are, are, are males, you know, and so they got to spawn with something other than them that's a female in order to reproduce. So the reproduction rates are very, very low and not enough to support and sustain a predator population of fish. And so that makes them a put and take fishery, you know, which people typically use them in conjunction like with channel catfish if they want it to diversify a little bit. Now, if you're going to have them with channel catfish, understand the stocking rate's going to determine how bad they wart you when you get ready to catch a few catfish. So keep that in mind. Okay, Michael Eric, Donnie treats me great. Bob, trying to save half the distance travel. I get that. I totally get that. Let's see what Charlie Selm says. Hello, I'm in Indiana. Stock my pond this spring with hybrid bluegill catfish, red ear, bluegill minnows, and grass carp. All fingerlings. I want largemouth bass, yet they didn't have any at the time. It was hot and dry in late July and August. A couple of weeks ago, we had about two inches of rain. All of a sudden, I had some fish die. All I found was about three of the six grass carp and a handful of bluegill and catfish. I don't think everything died, but I haven't seen any fish along the bank since. I want to get more bass. Should some more of the other fish also. Okay, let's see. You did that this spring um, a couple of weeks ago. Okay, so here's what happened. Let me tell you what happened. Mike McPherson's canning salsa, listening in, multitasking. That's pretty cool. So here's my here's my answer on the fish kill, Charlie. What very likely happened is you had that spell of hot weather. Your pond stratified, which means it, it formed a layer cake effect. You had a warm layer of water sitting on top of a cool layer of water. In the middle is the thermocline. You've heard that term before. And you guys that watch this show, you can explain it as good as I can. But what happens is that lower layer of water, that cooler layer, runs out of oxygen fairly quickly, sometimes within days, and becomes toxic. So when you get that two-inch rain and you get a whole bunch of cold water coming in on top of that warm water of layer, warm layer of water, that warm layer of water cools down to the same or cooler temperature than the layer below it. So it, water gets more dense on the top. Those two mix, or sometimes they'll even flip. And when that happens, that toxic anoxic water shoves up into the healthy water and some of the fish can't stand it. Now, since it only happened a couple of weeks ago and you're not seeing fish come to the surface to feed, um, if you can aerate that water some, you'll expedite the process. The fish, the fish that are still alive are distressed. So I would just about bet you your water had an odor to it and the odor would have been like a musty smell, a mildewy smell maybe. And now if the water's a little bit tea colored, that means it's going through its processes to cleanse itself. And the water ought to start looking closer to normal just within a few days, maybe another week. At that point, your fish should start coming back to your feed and you should start seeing them. Uh, the question I would, the answer I would give you is go to your supplier where you bought the fish. I don't know if you bought them from Matt Rail or, you know, or, Kevin Bjornson over in Iowa. I don't know where you where you got them, but if you will uh, find your supplier, talk to Matt Rail at uh, uh, American Pond and Lake Management in Rusheville, Indiana. He can help you solve that dilemma. He can probably come over there and take a look at it and then advise you on what you need to do. So, you know, over the summer, the pond's job was to build up the food chain. Now it's had a hiccup. I doubt that all the fish died. I doubt it was just, there were some, but the, the others are sick. They're on ventilators. You heard that word a lot lately. They're gonna, most of them are gonna heal. Some of them might not. You might see a few more float up, but the majority of them are gonna heal. And once they heal, then they're gonna be able to go back out and make an honest living and start feeding again, reproduce one more time before fall, maybe there in Indiana, depending on what part of Indiana you're in. 
and uh, uh, you might need to stock a few more just to, just, just to have peace about it. Okay, Robert Dyer in the summer heat. Would a tiger muskie choose to eat bluegill, crappie, or bullhead as a preference based on where they're hanging out during the hot months? Or are they just whatever, everything, whenever they want? Um, they are not selective. They're, they are the ultimate ambush feeder. So they're going to be sitting up in those plants. Now, they do want cooler water because they're cooler water fish. So they're going to be sitting typically in plants, in a mat of plants, waiting for a fish to come by. They don't care if it's a bullhead. They don't care if it's a if it's a three-pound puppy. Well, they kind of do. Puppies, eh, I don't know. Maybe they don't. Depends on how big the My wife knows I do this show every Wednesday, and she's calling me. <laughs> okay, so um, they're going to eat whatever they want. And if they have to, to, to leave and pursue because nothing's swimming by, they'll do that. But they don't care what it is. Aaron Gilbreth. I had some dirt work done to my dam on my pond back in February because it was thin, had willows, and was leaking. While the dirt guy was there... Uh-oh. Hold it. Uh-oh. I messed up. Bear with me a minute. All right. Now I can see it. Because it was thin, had willows, was leaking while the dirt guy was there. I had a small cove dug out for dirt for the house pad. When he got down 8 to 10 feet, we noticed that some water was coming in and mixing with the sand. It's very sandy there. I'm afraid now it's leaking in that small cove. It appears it's losing about an inch and a half of water a month over the last couple of months. I was recommended using soil flock in that area. Have you heard anything about that product or do you recommend something else? I've heard nothing but great things about that product. But let me tell you this. I don't know where you are, but if it's only leaking an inch and a half, oh, wait, 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 1.5 feet of water a month. Oh my gosh, yeah. If you're using, if you're losing a, a, a foot and a half of water a month, you're leaking. You know, your evaporation rates, depending on where you are, like right now is maximum at half an inch a day. You know, and if you don't have water coming in to, to support that, you probably, excuse me, you probably are um, losing that. If you go to palmboss.com, click on Ask the Boss, and find TJ, I think he spells it T-E-E-J-A-E-H. It's TJ Hudson from Lincoln, Nebraska, on the website, on the forum, on palmboss.com. He is our go-to guy about soil flock. Now, you can also contact soil flock directly. There's an advertisement in Pond Boss, which, by the way, look at there. Here is the here is the latest edition, just hot off the presses. It's in mailboxes now, and there it is. Take a take a good close look. Thirty five bucks a year, <coughs> cheaper than a Friday night date, and it lasts a lot longer. It lasts a year. Friday night date's gone in just a real short period of time. Got some great content in here. There's a soil flock ad in the magazine. If you want to subscribe, I'm going to ask you to. Please do that. You can go to pondboss.com or you can call the office. And there's phone number. 800-687-6075 or 903-564-6144. Talk to Leanne and she will help you with it. In this issue of the magazine, holy cow, let's see, we've got, we've got uh, Living the Dream Part 1, a novice's steep learning curve. A first-time pond owner learns about renovating by Gil Lackey. Uh, Building Lake Deanna, that's a pretty pretty cool project there. Um, talking about, there's one really, really cool article there about reducing nutrients in a pond. And it's, it's, it's pretty cool. They use some really cool um, mats and plant plants in them and extract phosphorus that way. Here's an article on harvesting fish. Here's one about whitening. So in other words, it, when alkalinity is so high in the summer months and the pond can't keep up with its own photosynthesis, lime starts to, to kind of flock and turn turn the water cloudy white, which that's really interesting. So there's a, some really, really good, good stories in here. Here's summer oxygen depletions. Talking about what, what I just talked about, except going into it in greater detail. So there you go. 35 bucks a year. You can go to palmboss.com and find it. But you can also go to palmboss.com, click on the resource guide, and you can find out about soil flock right there. 
there's an ad. You can call them and talk to them as well. So, Soil Flock is a good product and the right application. You need to be coached to it. TJ can help you with that, or the people at Soil Flock can help you with that. And we got this ongoing cool conversation between James Allen and uh, Robert Dyer, Danny Mack, and Tim Sturt, their buddies. Okay, Danny Mack, I have a story to write about my attempt. You know what? I'm just about ready to start working on the November, December issue. December issue. I'm going to pull up your private message on Facebook and then be getting in touch with you when I'm ready there, Danny Mack. Let's see here. Fred Bingham, a great answer on the Georgia Giants. So many historic arguments in the Palm Boss Forum. Yeah, that was a that was a hot topic there because there was a, a lady named Deb, I think if I remember right, Fred, that, that worked at that fish hatchery in Georgia. And she got attacked unmercifully. And a bunch of folks jumped to her defense and they ended up being a pretty hearty, helpful, thoughtful discussion. And she, I think she took another job somewhere else so that that discussion disappeared. But it was, it was a good, healthy discussion. I liked it back then. That was a long time ago. Vito, so eat. So fish eat the most during the same time of year men eat the most. Mother-in-law's day to keep us from saying something stupid in Thanksgiving when we're giving thanks to turkeys and their fixings. Vito, I love you, man. You you know this deal. So think about when you're in there grazing on a big old turkey leg that your bluegill are out there enjoying whatever you provided for them. Give thanks. Billy Bates, yep, knew about the spawning issues with the hybrids and their other issues. Just a local place at Georgia Giants. And you answered my question because I was skeptical. All right. Jacob West, diving under pond, we found the thermocline. Burr, I bet 15 degree difference. Yeah, yeah. Everything below that level was black. Not much buildup, but black in color. What makes that color? The color is a lack of sunlight and what's dissolved into the water. So what's going on, Jacob, is that's anaerobic now which means it's anoxic, has no oxygen, so it can't process its waste, so they're mostly dissolved in it. If you were to take some of that water and, and put it in a jar and bring it up and smell it, you can smell the odor. It's real musty smelling. It's, it smells bad because the water can't process its waste fast as, as the top layers send it down there to be processed. You know, So what will happen when the water temperatures start to cool in the fall It'll cool slowly most of the time. And then those two layers of water will integrate naturally, slowly. And then the healthy water will process that waste, change the color of the water, and it'll, it'll, it'll look more normal. Okay, let's see here. Boy, this hour's flown by. Holy cow. Stephen Martin, finally got my leak sealed up in my half acre pond. All the perch and minnows survived and reproduced. I've got one largemouth bass in there. I bet that's a happy camper, but maybe lonely. How many more bass should I put in it with a stable food chain? I'd say nine more. If you've got 10 in a half acre pond, that's a pretty good start. They're going to reproduce and help control their own numbers. If you stock more than that, you're going to have more than what the pond can support over a longer period of time. And preserve them. Don't let the water turkeys eat them. Chris Sample, Fort Worth, Texas here. Bought a property with about a half acre pond that is completely overrun by algae. Where do I begin? Um, Fort Worth, Texas. You know, because of the, the we've had such fluctuating temperatures and nutrient loads with rainfall, it's been a perfect storm for algae to grow. Now, if you want to treat algae now, you can, but you can also leave it alone and let it grow out. And as the water temperature begins to cool, it will start to dissipate some. Now, if it's actively growing and you want to use the pond and it's in your way, then I would look at, uh, go to the resource guide and find a pond management company that's not far away from you. There's American Sport Fish. I think there's um, uh, Solitude has an office nearby. There's several of them that can help treat algae, or you can do it yourself, but, but take some time to learn about it. Go to Aquaplant, aquaplant.com. T-A-M-U dot E-D-U, I think. But if you just Google Aquaplant and look up algaes, it's going to show you your options on what to do about it. Josie, Vito is funny. Vito's, oh, I've known Vito since he was in middle school, and that boy's got a sense of humor and is healthy. You know, some people make fun of people. Vito makes fun of life and hits it 
and loves Brussels sprouts, and they make him gain weight. So we love Vito. All right, so I'm going to start wrapping it up. We've got a few miles to make, and I really appreciate you guys checking in. Remember, Palm Balls Magazine, subscribe, 35 bucks a year, cheaper than a Friday night date, lasts a lot longer, and there's nuggets in every one of them that you can use. I promise that. So I do appreciate you, you folks checking in, watching this show. Um, I'm humbled by how many people actually watch it and then come back and watch it later, which just fascinates me. I love it. And uh, until next Wednesday, I'm going to tell you adios. Go get in the truck. I'm going to make a few miles. See you next Wednesday, wherever I am.